Okay, so today, the last lecture, we're talking about epigenetics, specifically DNA methylation. Okay, so this is a pretty hot topic, if you want to call it that. It's been even, it was in Times Magazine about two years ago. Uh, and we are, um, like I said, we're going to talk specifically about DNA methylation, which is one of the events that are that fall under, uh, under this umbrella of epigenetics. So this is the mo one of the motivating slides. So this is just two, this is two species. They are their genomes are very different are, are very similar, but they're different enough to explain a lot of a lot of the phenotypic differences we see. Right, so if we look at the human genome and we look at the chimp genome, we will see differences. Now, these, these cells that are tissues or organisms are all, in terms of their genomes, are, are identical. Right? So we have embryos, child, child, embryo to child to adult, and they're all, um, they all have to start off with one cell that has the same genome, starts splitting, and the same genome keeps on being propagated. But they're very different. And, and there's another example here showing brain and brain cell and liver cell. Again, same genome, very different phenotypes. So what, what explains these differences? Now the other, uh, the other uh, important factor to remember is that, the for example, liver, when it splits, when it divides, you get liver again. So there's some kind of memory at, my, at, the, lev at the level of mitosis division that somehow preserve some information, enough information, to create another liver cell. So that is what uh, epigenetics is trying, one of, the, one of the things that the people that study epigenetics are trying to figure out. How does that happen? So this is an, a cartoon and it's used to illustrate that the genome is a, is a little bit more complicated than ju just a series of bases, right? A, T, C, G, right? It's, there's, more, there's more to it. There's a lot of structure. And to, to put it in perspective, the DNA molecule, if you stretch it out, it's about two meters long, and it's all crammed into a little nucleus that is about two micrometers or something. Very, very, very small. So in order to do that, you can imagine you have to twist and turn a lot. And this, this figure, this cartoon, is showing you some of those structures. Here's a, over here is a chromosome, and then we're starting to pull out the string of DNA. When we look closely, it's, first of all, it's, it, it sort of coils around like that. And then the, another thing that happens is that some of the DNA is a little bit more compressed and others are more open. And there's all these proteins and events that make that happen. Here's an, a specific cartoon illustration where you have the same gene. I mean, I'll zoom in of that. So you have the same genome, and here in this pink line, we're representing a gene, and it is illustrating how you can have the same genome, yet in one version of it, it the gene is exposed so it can get expressed, and the other one, the gene is not exposed so it won't get expressed. And these little these little <coughs> circles, these little discs are histones, they're proteins, which the uh, DNA wraps around, and there's different, uh, th there's different alterations that can be done to these histones, chemical alterations, and also to the, to the genome itself, one of them is the one we're talking about today, it's DNA methylation. It's actually not in this cartoon, but in the previous one. But the, the main point is that you can, uh, if we can have a mechanism that keeps keeps this structure as when the cell divides, keeps this structure, then that gene won't be expressed not only in the mother cell but in the daughter cells. And similarly over there, that structure that, that is open can be preserved, and that is that's going to be preserved when the cell divides, and you can get memory without having differences in the DNA. That's the key part. Okay, so how well, DNA methylation is one that is particularly interesting because it is known to be preserved in uh, mitosis. 
So I'll, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction to the DNA methylation, how it works, and then we're going to show some data and some of the technologies used to measure it. So this is a cartoon of a little part of the little piece of the genome, five prime to three prime end, and you can if you follow down, you can see there's a CG here. Keep going. There's another CG here, and on the other side of the on, from the five prime to three prime from the other side the other strand, you'll see the C there's also a CG and a CG, right, because the C and G are complementary. So whenever there's a CG <coughs> on one side, there's a CG on the other. Now, that, why am I telling you this? Because methylation occurs mostly at uh, CGs. Some, think, some, some people think that in, in, most tish, in some tissues it's entirely in CGs. So another important property when the when and the DNA replicates, the, the methylation status will be preserved. So now you have DNA replicates, and now you have, if you, if you think about this for a sec, you, you really have information for four different, not four bases, but you can think of it as five bases, because you have five possibilities. A, T, G, C, and methylated C, and it's preserved when it splits. So you have five bases, and it's preserved in division. So it's, that's how information can be passed along. All right, so that, that means that you can have two tissues, liver and brain, the same genome, but different genes are getting expressed maybe because different CPGs are being methylated. That's why one of the reasons why it's so interesting to many biologists is this, is this fact. So you can you, you we and it's it's known to be involved in development. There's a lot of recent data showing that, and um, we're basically going to talk about how to measure it. All right. So that's those those are the basic facts. And then when these t when these brain is a bad example, but because it doesn't really replicate, but uh, the the cell doesn't divide. But when liver splits, then it's liver again. That's nice. okay. So, so that's my two-minute introduction to DNA methylation. Now, um, like I said, it's, it happens at C followed by G, from the fi from the five prime to the three prime. That's where methylation occurs. C followed by G. So we're going to look at where these C's followed by G's are. So it's a dinucleotide. All right. Now, um, this is a figure of counts for G followed by C. It's different than C followed by G, right? G, C, as opposed to C, G. Now, if you, if you take bins of 16 base pairs on the genome and you count C, G, G, Cs, how, how many do you think on average you will see if we have 16 bases? What, what proportion should be C, Gs, G, G, Cs? If it's just random. It's a rough one in what? One in, what did you say? One in? I think you said the right thing. One in sixteen. Okay? It's not quite right because G's and C's are actually less common than A and T's. So it's more like one in twenty. But yeah, it's like you multiply chance of a C times the chance of a C, and that's how many, roughly, how you, and that's what this data is showing that shows that you get. So you expect to see between 0 and 3. If it's, a, if it's random, it's going to be a Poisson count, and that's actually exactly what this looks like. So you sometimes have 0, sometimes have 1, sometimes have 2s and 3s. So this is what, it, this is what this plot, this, a plot like this would look like <laughs> for GCs, ATs, TAs, GAs, but for, G, for CPG, C, and by the way, I'm going to start saying CPG instead of CG. The P is for the phosphate that's in between the two. If you're going from 5 to 3 prime. The CPGs, notice how much less there are. So that's because uh, CPGs are depleted in the genome. Methylation actually makes, many, makes, it makes it more likely for the C to mutate. So I guess through evolution, these guys have been depleted from the genome. So you can actually down. This is not a fun exercise. You download or you, or you upload um, your genome to R, 
and you take check sections of, of the genome and you can count. There's a function called pattern match that can just count patterns like CG or GC. And you'll see, you'll see that there's many, much, much less CPG than any other dinucleotide. So while other bases is about 1 in 16, 1 in 20, CPGs are 1 in 100. All right, so now there's another little fact. The, the few remaining CPGs tend to cluster. This is, this is again, this is real data from the genome, and you can see here in, around, <coughs> around, this re around this region, there's much more than in other places. You don't see this with other d dinucleotides. The CPGs tend to cluster, and th this is an observation that was made about 30 years ago, or maybe a little more, and it is, they started calling them CPG islands, the places where this happens. CPG islands. So how do you define CPG islands? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So the point is that, it, that there's, there's, the CPGs are depleted, and the few that remain are in clusters. So if we're going, why is this going to matter later? It's going to matter because for two reasons. One, these islands appear to be enriched near the promoter of genes. That's something that we observe. And when we look for where they are, they tend to be promoters of genes. So they might be involved in regulation, gene regulation, the methylation at or around these islands. And also, if, if, so if that's the case, that, that means that we're more interested in, in, in those particular regions, and if we're going to measure, it will be much easier to measure island methylation than genome methylation, because there's, there's, you're grouping, you're just looking at, a, I think it's 20,000 or so of these, and you can... Um, you can just focus on measuring methylation at those regions. That's one of the approaches that, that was taken until recently. Still, some people do that. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to I'm going to talk a briefly about a I'm going to make an aside from the measurement of DNA methylation to talk a little bit about interesting statistical work you can do in defining islands. It's computational slash statistical. So this is a current definition of an island, and this is not from nature, this is an observation. People saw roughly what they look like, and early on, the first people that define islands decided on this definition. It's somewhat arbitrary, these cutoffs, but that's what we, are, we use today. So, it, so basically, what is it saying? If you have a region that has more than 200 base pairs, and the DC content is more than 50%, and the observed... CPGs to the expected number of CPGs is bigger than 0.6, that is an island. So here, this is a little strange, right? So why isn't it, why isn't it more than one? It's because typically the observed to expected is what? From the free, I mean, this is a little harder to figure out, but you can figure it out. If, if, if I tell you that the rate of CPGs is one in a hundred, but the, what is the expected rate? If it were just random, we already answered that question. One in 20. So the typical observed to expected ratio is 0.2. Right? That's, the, that's a typical expected ratio observed to expect in the genome. But every once in a while, we see these clusters where it's bigger than 0.6. And those are islands. So one, one, that's one approach. So what you do is you write an algorithm that just searches through for what cases where this happens, and that's what's currently done. That gives you a list of about 20,000 for a human. And, you know, it's on the databases. You can go get them, download them. You'll get this chromosome beginning and end for islands. But when you do that, remember, that is a definition that has these arbitrary cutoffs. So that, there might be other little clusters that are not islands, but really look a lot like islands. So... One, one other, another thing we can do, instead of having a definition like this, is, is use data-driven approaches to try to just find clusters. And hidden Markov models are a very nice tool for doing such things. So hidden Markov models are a, st a statistical tool that has been around for decades and decades. And it's a very simple, nice idea where you, you assume there's states. In this case, the two states would be not, not island and island. 
and you assume that as you transverse through time, you the mark, HMMs were originally devised for time, but you can think of the chromosome as time. As you move in time, you can move from one state to another with some probability. And the hidden part, that, that's just what, a, that's kind of, that's what a Markov model is, but the hidden part is that you, don't, you never see the states. You see an outcome that depends on the state. In this case, the outcome would be something like the observed to expected ratio. So you try, you try to decipher what the states are from some outcome that is indirectly related to that. So one of the nice things about uh, doing it with, with hidden Markov models as opposed to using a definition is that th if there are other species have islands and you want to find them, then this definition was developed for humans. It might not apply for other species. Okay, so here, this is, a, this is real data from the genome. You can do it very quickly. You can maybe do this for TGs and see what it looks like uh, later. So this is a plot for the entire genome. You can take little bins, and for each bin, you compute the GC content. That's what the G plus C is representing. And you can also compute the rate of, of CGs. All right, so you can see down here, so one in, a, one in a hundred is around here, right? And that's where most of the data is. And so you see there's one, this is the typical location on the genome, has a GC content of about 40%, and it has a CG content of about one in a hundred. But then all of a sudden you see this uptake here, see? That, that, those must be the islands. But it's not, it's not like an obvious, an obvious split. It seems to be somewhat smooth. So the cutoffs are maybe a little more fuzzy than, you know, so they might be a little more fuzzy than the cutoffs would make you believe. So for other species, it looks a little bit different than this. I don't have any pictures of other species. But. So um, the, how would, the, how would the, the hidden Markov model work? You would, w one thing you can do is you can, first of all, adjust the observed to expect the ratio idea is a good one because the genome, the, C, the GC content of the genome changes. And that's, in this picture, I have stratified the genome by the GC content. So this first pane is the part of the genome where GC content is between 70 and 80 percent. And this last pane, I'm sorry, 80 to 100 percent. And this last pane is between 0 and 2 percent. Sorry, 20%. Right, so now what, what are the histogram? The histogram is the CPG content by in these regions. So you can see in, when it's high, you can see two very clear groups. And I think those are the islands, and these are not islands. Here, you can these are probably islands, and here are not, not islands. So now it's a little bit more mushed together. Here, these are probably islands, and these, etc. Right, so the point is that the the total number of CPGs is going to be different in different islands depending on what the, what the GC content is. And that, that was a very insightful observation from the people who originally defined islands, that you need to, to look at that correction. That's why they looked at the ratio, not just the total number of CPGs. So it's not just a matter of how much they cluster. It's how much they cluster condition on how much you expect there to be. So the hidden Markov model is going to be based on the expected number of CPGs given the GC content. So once you do that, so here, by the way, is a plot of GC content on the genome. And you can do this very easily on, on R. Just count GC content. And you can see that there's like, this movement in the genome where you have some parts where it's lowish, and then all, all of a sudden it kind of goes up for, CG, for GC content. So as we move along here, we're going, to do, we're going to have a hidden Markov model, but the expected number of CPGs is going to change as we move along, and we're going to use the smooth line to do it. Okay, so, so this, is, this is maybe more than you want to see, but the idea is that you, model, you, have, you have to model two states, and basically the two states are, are going to define here. This is the key line here. So there's this alpha i. This is the, you're gonna, we're going to assume it's a Poisson count in each, depending on the state, the, the rate of CPGs is going to be 
alpha i, and i is either 1 or 2, depending on the state, times the expected CG, which is P, the, pro, the proportion of Cs times the proportion of Gs times the length of the interval. So we're going to break up the interval in pieces. In each piece, we're going to assume it's either one state or the other. If it's state 1, then the expected number of CPGs is alpha 1 times PC times PG. If it's the, the, the island state, then there's another alpha 2. So what is the advantage of doing this over the algorithm that we did before? The main advantage is that alpha i are going to be estimated from the data. So for the human, for the human data, we expect alpha 1 to be 0.2 for non-islands and 0.6 for islands. Right? That's what we expect from the definitions, or a little bit bigger than 0.6. But for other species, we might have other results. And in fact, we actually do get that. So uh, we actually ran Henry Markov models on a bunch of species. These are all species you can get from the internet, from, from the databases. So no experiments. This was a, a result that we didn't have to create any new data. Download all, all, this, all, the, all the genomes for all these species and then run a hidden Markov model. And what I'm showing you here are alpha, the alpha estimates for against for um, islands versus the alpha estimates for um, the baseline. Actually, this is this is alpha one divided by alpha zero, the ratio of the island versus non-island alphas, and here is the baseline. So one of the neat things when I I, I really kind of like looking at this picture because you can see evolution a little bit here. Right? So these are these two are E. coli and yeast. So the difference between alpha 1 and alpha 0 is none. They're the same. So what does that mean? See if you're following the model. If alpha 1 is equal to alpha 0, what does that mean about these species? Say that again? There's no islands, right? There's no islands. The island and the non-islands are the same because there hasn't been any evolutionary change in, the, in that sense. But, and but that doesn't mean there's no relation. Uh, no, not necessarily. There's, just no, there, there's no evidence <coughs> for clustering. So now here are, these are insects. The purples are insects. I don't know which is which, but it includes honeybee, fly, mosquito, and some kind of fly and some kind of other fly. Uh, and then here are the, the uh, worms, are the orange. So the worms and the flies are together. Then here are the fish. See, the f these are the fish. These are the plants. Uh, the birds are up here. And these guys are the primates. Human, chimp, and orangutan. They're very, very similar. And then the, the other big mammals are all over the place, kind of up here. But you can see this line, almost like showing that evolution is taking us towards having few islands with, with very, very high difference between the island and the non-island. Okay, so that's just the f I f uh, fun, I think it's a fun way to use statistics on data that's publicly available, no new experiments. But it really doesn't relate that much to the rest of the lecture where we're talking about how to measure DNA methylation. The only way it relates to that is because there's a lot of the focus is to measure, it has been, I think it's changing now, has been to measure methylation at islands for humans. So this is, uh, this first bullet point here, I would call that a conventional wisdom in 2004. Certainly, it still might be the conventional wisdom. What do you think, people that are in methylation? Do you think that's the conventional wisdom still? Yeah. Yes? Okay, so it still is. So now we're talking about cancer, specifically, which is where DNA methylation is, has been most studied. It's been studied in development and cancer. So hypermethylated CPG islands silence tumor suppressor genes. So that if that's true, it's a big deal because we can go, we can we can create diagnostics, and we can maybe create target 
uh, targeted uh, uh, drugs or whatever to, to change whatever it is that is causing uh, the, the suppressor genes to get expressed, uh, so to get silenced. So one thing I didn't mention is that unlike mutations, DNA methylation is a is a weaker chemical bond, so it might it's a, it's, e it's a little bit easier to, to to reverse than a mutation. Actually, not a little, a lot easier. So the, it gives us more hope for um, targeted uh, drugs. Now there's another result, and it's that cancer cells are globally hypomethylated. So there's less methylation globally, but in islands it's hypermethylated. So they, they seem a little contradictory, contradictory, but we'll see that it's not the case. That both of these are appear to be, at least empirically, they appear to be true. At least the fa not, not maybe not the part about the suppressor suppressing genes, but the part about islands being hypermethylated in cancer. That is certainly something we, we see when, when we look at data. Okay, so now in 2004, microarrays start getting into the picture of people working in DNA methylation, and manufacturers start creating uh, products for measuring DNA methylation. And a lot of these products. <coughs> were uh, focused on islands because of that first bullet point there. Now, um, some of the people that I, uh, one, a scientist I work here at Hopkins, Andy Feinberg, he was he's very interested in this topic, and he was interested in measuring DNA methylation not just in islands but in the entire genome, and to sort of check if these two two things were were true or not. So well, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to basically talk a little bit about the, the, the way that we measure DNA methylation and, and check these, these assumptions and some of the things we found. Okay, so before I continue with this, I want to make it a little pause and sort of talk about the, some, of, some of the things I've been thinking about, what, how this way of thinking of looking at the whole genome and, and I mean, using these new technologies to to look, to sort of make observations that we 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 can't we couldn't make before, is similar to a moment I think a moment in history where a lot of discoveries were made. And this guy, Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Anybody know what he discovered? He is the father of micro microbiology, right? He discovered microbes. He saw them for the first time, and he also was the first. He discovers, I think, he discovered spermatozoa. I think he discovered that blow, uh, blood flows through through the veins or so, something related to that. Do you know wh how he made all those discoveries? Microscope? He invented the microscope. So he invents the microscope and then he discovers all this stuff. So today I think there's a, there's a new microscope and it's uh, it's you can microarrays already are kind of a microscope like this is but this is a high a sequencing machine and w the point I'm making is that now we are seeing we're able to look at things that we've never been able to look at before so we can make discoveries just by looking now it's a little bit different than than it was with the microscope because the microscope the biologist looks through the microscope and sees like little things swimming around now you, you there's no peephole here there's no like ocular anything here uh, you have you, you basically get a big disk a hard drive full of data full of byte you know full of digital data and now how, what do you do with it and that's why it's a little that's why I I'm talking about this here in this class because those, you guys are here to learn about data analysis and the point I'm making is that the transition to go from the data to actually something that you see, you need people that know how to analyze data, you need collaborative teams, and that's how the new discoveries are going to be made. But there's, a, I think, a big parallel between what happened when, when the microscope was invented and what's going to happen in the next few years. Because we're going to, we can see things that we've never seen before. And I'm going to give you a few examples of cases where we saw things that we had never seen before just because we had access to the raw data 
And I was particularly fortunate to see one of these for the first time because a biologist gave me the data and said, we want to see something here. And I got to see it first because I had the data and I was the one who could make the figures. Um, not, I didn't steal their <laughs> ideas, but I was, I was actually seeing it first. So um, the first... The first data, uh, some of the data I'm going to show comes from microarrays. These are, they're still very relevant, microarrays for DNA methylation. I think they're slowly, they're going to they're gonna start be becoming irrelevant, but, it's, we're, we're, but we're not there yet. Uh, they have a good three to five years left, at least. Uh, but, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit, because I, I know that the people in this class with methylation data, about 80% of them have microarray data. Maybe more. So, uh, th so how does it work? The general idea, and there's different approaches, but the general idea that's depicted in this cartoon is that you have uh, a trick, and I'm not going to talk about these tricks. There's several tricks, but you have a trick that can separate the methylated part of the genome from the unmethylated part of the genome. What are these tricks? Some of them are based on, on, um, on like the, on. on um, enzymes that cut if it's methylated and don't cut if it is or vice versa. It's also based on on, on chip approaches like Hong Kai talked about. Remember chip chip? Well or chip seek where well, there's a chip version for methylation that 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 can grab the methylated part of the genome and, and leave the other part. Uh, the, so now once you've done once, once you've accomplished this, once you have separated the genome into two pieces, into the methylated part and the unmethylated part, you can put it on a microarray uh, and, and, and see, what, see what you see. And what, what are the probes on this microarray now? So what, what are the probes going to be? So a probe, just like ChIP-seq, just like Hong Kai talked about, a probe is basically telling you, is this part of the genome in your sample? So this is, a, this is real data from a, a part of the genome. And it's like, a, it's like one of these tiling arrays that are used in ChIP-seq and ChIP-chip. But what we're putting on the array is unmethylated DNA. So the fraction of the DNA that is unmethylated is being put on the array. And each probe represents a different location on the array. That's the idea. Now, if you look at this picture, you say, and I ask you, what part of, this, of the genome is most unmethylated? Which one would you point at? It's kind of obvious, right? So you would point at this. So well, that part certainly is, this is methylated, and that is unmethylated, right? That's what you would conclude if you just looked at that. But we've learned something in this class that should make you be a little bit more uh, skeptical about that. What have we learned in this class that makes you think, well, that's probably not true? Yes, but what, in this case, what is, the, what is the thing you would worry about the most? Yes, which effect, so GC content is maybe what's driving it, but the probe effect, um, in this case it might just be GC, but the probe effect, for example, can make some parts be high, other parts be low, when it's, and it has nothing to do with methylation. And that's actually what's happening here, because I also have another, another data set. This is a two-color array. I also have the green channel that has the total DNA, where everything is, is in it. It's not just the enriched DNA part is everything, and we see the same pattern. When we take the ratio, now it looks like this, and it's good that it looks like this because I didn't tell you this earlier, but that region of the genome has no CPGs, so there can't be methylation, and that's what the array is saying. Except I can't trust, I can't trust the, the signal from one channel. I need to take the ratio. So that's what these arrays do. They usually take the either methylated or unmethylated, depending on what the technique uh, tells you to do, uh, uh, divided by total, and that gives you, a, gives you an idea of how much methylation there is. So this is the log ratio, just like we've been doing before. The log ratio is zero. <coughs> oh, and it's been normalized so that zero means no methylation. That's a little tricky to do. I'm not going to get into how we do that, but it needs some work for that to happen. Okay. So there it is. That's just what I explained. I'm not going to go over it again. All right, so normalization is important. I'll refer you to one paper that's down there. 
Um, but raw data can look like it has patterns, but once you normalize, a lot of them go away. A lot has to do with probe effects, normalization, all the stuff we've learned, same things happen here. Okay, now, so I'm not going to talk, we've talked about enough about pre-processing, I'm not going to talk about how, how it's done in isolation. Instead, I'm going to move ahead and assume we have data that can be used and, and, and talk about how we find regions that are different. So we have cancer in normal cells, and we want to find regions that are different. We want to check, is it true that islands are higher in cancer and lower in normals? Is it true that overall there's differences where cancer has le less methylation? So can we check that using this data? Also, we're going we're gonna to look at data from different tissues and maybe some other stuff. Let's see. All right, so I'm going to call... The regions of interest, differentially methylated regions, meaning I'm looking for regions that in, uh, let's say I'm comparing two conditions, that in one condition compared to the other are different in their methylation measurements. So here is an example of, a, of real data from cancer normal. So I have the genome location on the x-axis. This is microarray data, by the way, but sequencing data looks similar. So here's the genome. Uh, this this line, this density ha is the CPG density. There doesn't appear to be many CPGs here. Uh, and now we have eight, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight cancer samples, and one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight normal samples. So at each probe, we have eight, eight, 16 values, 16, 16 values. And what I'm looking for are regions where there's a difference. Okay, so this is, this is what, the raw, what the data looks like. Now, first thing I want to clarify. Methylation, it either is or it's not methylated, right? And we have 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. So what is that? Why are we getting those numbers? So it, nobody really understands what happens at the single cell very well yet, but it, it, uh, the data seems to show that it's, it's rarely the case that an, a, at a particular CPG, all the cells of a particular cell type are going to be all not methylated or all methylated. So 100% and 0% is rare when you look at population of cells, which is today, in 2012, what the majority of scientists are doing. Looking at one, little, one single cell is very difficult because it's hard to get enough material out of it. So most data that we look at is millions of cells, is that right? Millions of cells so that we can get enough material. Now, it could, be, it could also be that we, are not, we don't have pure cells, that we're looking at a mixture. So this is colon. I forgot to say that. Um, colon, so we have a little bit of, I mean, there's different kinds of cell types in the colon, which I must admit I don't know what they're called. But how many? Three different, four different types of cells. So there could be a mixture where some are and some aren't methylated. But I, don't, I think that even if it were just pure, the same cell, I still think, that there's some variability, there's some randomness in, in the process, a real randomness, not a measurement error randomness that makes it so that we have pr proportions of cells methylated at a site, not all of them, not all ones, all zero. So the typical data in methylation experiments looks like this. We have numbers between zero and one. All right, so what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to look for regions that are differentially methylated. So I'm going to fit a statistical model to each, I'm going to start out by fitting a statistical model at each site and this, this is what I'm writing out here, it's actually much simpler than what it appears from the math, but I'm going to say that this is methylation, it's been transformed maybe to be, so it could be logit of methylation, so it's between, it's in the continuum instead of between 0 and 1, um, and it is going to have, it is going to follow a, t a pattern, it's represented by this function, for sample i at location j, we're going to have a, a, a pattern that all of them follow, so this is the pattern at location j, plus a difference, this is the, the difference pattern, that only, say, the cancers will get, so x1, could be 1 for the cancers and 0 for the normals. 
and then there's measurement error. So this is what we've we've learned to use a a program in R in Bioconductor that fits models like this. Can anybody say what it is? What mo what? R? R? Lima. 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 Right, that's the one. Lima fits these models. But now we're gonna do it for every low size, so we're gonna get a beta for every low size. So yeah, question? More of a comment. Um, now the new trend in cancer is to look at subclonal populations of cells. Uh, before it was thought that a cancer cell all of a sudden at a certain point if one clone populates most of the tissue. And now okay. with, more, with sequencing, with deep sequencing, we're identifying subclones. So eventually a, a refurbished or a more Okay. Uh, so you're saying the X you would need for three or four X. Fine, no, I'm no no, you own Yes, you yes. would need three dummy One. variables. Yeah. Sure, that's fine. This is a general model. You can have more than that. You can have a continuum. Yeah. So, so I should say, uh, we, why do statisticians write something so simple, so complicated? It's because we can use the same model for a case. Forget about the clones. You can do age. Age is not, there's not zero, one. It's a, it's a continuum. X could be age. So then beta is what, the way to interpret beta is for every one, every time you, you're a year older, your methylation increases beta, or, your, or the logit of your methylation increases beta. Okay, so I can run this on Lima. I can look for betas that appear to be different. Here are two examples. The, those look pretty good, right? Here are the normals. Here are the tumors, normals, tumors. This one has a, it's, it looks better than that one, right? It's more, it's, the difference is stronger. Now, for methylation, remember, now we have to think about what's happening at, at the cell level. We are think, we're, we're, in the back of our minds, we're always thinking of how, not, we're not interested directly in methylation, but what methylation does downstream. For example, how does it affect expression? So, in order to affect expression, we tend to think that there's going to be groups of of uh, CPGs that are methylated together or unmethylated together to have an effect. Just one CPG on its own, it's, it's sometimes hard, although there are some papers published claiming that with one CPG difference can make a difference in expression. I, I want to see a little bit more evidence on that front, but in general, the big changes are observed when groups of CPGs are changing together. So that's not in this picture. So do we trust just one measurement? Well, we can always, with this data, it's easy enough. By the way, that's what the beta estimate would be for these two. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, there's the first one. The first one comes from here. You see it, where the, all the reds are down and all the blues are up here? All right, that was the first one. But the ones around it are not showing anything. And by the way, these lines, these are smooth lines. Remember we learned about low S? That's, those are low S fits. So even though the, uh, the single CPG is showing a difference, if you look at the low S lines, it's, trying to, it's assuming there's a function, a smooth function going through there, says there's nothing going on. So which of those two do I trust? No. Here's, a, here's the other CPG. It's one of these. I can't remember which one, but it's one of these. But now look at, look at the neighbors for that CPG. That now looks more striking. So we are looking across the genome. This is a new thing. We Actually, it's not a new thing. ChIP-seq, we did it. In ChIP-seq, we didn't look at a single location. We looked for peaks that involve neighboring locations. So um, that's, that's what we're going to be looking for. We're going to be looking for differences like this. You, want. you can go if you want, unless you want to listen to this. Okay. Um, all right. All right. So now uh, the batch effect shows up in, in 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 methylation data very strongly. Here's an example. This this data I was showing you had actually two groups <coughs> that were processed at different times. The the cancers and normals were balanced, but there but nevertheless there was two groups. And if you color by group, you can see that, that, that there's there are locations where not only one CPG is different. 
but a whole group of them in a row are different, which makes it appear a lot like a DM, like a like a region that's changing. So how can we deal with this? We learned about SVA. We can apply the same ideas here. So this is basically the SVA model written out, but now um, we have these betas as functions of the of the genome. But it's basically the same as SVA, so we can fit this with SVA. It'll find the, the, the batch. And if we do that, we actually get we actually do pretty well. I might have a figure showing how it improves things to fit it with S, with the SVA approach. Okay, so now if we think that differences are are um, important differences are groups of CPGs, regions, not just one single one. That changes the way we find them. Because we're not going to go search for individual ones. We're actually going to go from the get-go, go and trying to find regions that are different. So I'm going to explain one simple approach to doing that. It's similar to the approach that Hong Kai talked about with Chipsec. It has some similarities, but also some differences. All right, so that model I just showed you, actually, I said age, and this is an example where I am using age. It's general. It's not just cancer normal. This is an example where I'm, using, I'm applying it to age. So here in the y-axis, there's methylation estimates, 0 through 1, right? And in the x-axis, I have the age. These are babies, so it's only like 220 days old. Uh, actually, no, gestational age. So that's since conception. So they're newborns. Some of them have been born a little earlier than they should. So what we're, what we're looking for are locations of the genome that depend on gestational age. So this picture is for one CPG, just one. Why are there so many points? Because we have a lot of babies. Right? So now we fit, we, we look for a, a, a relationship. The slope of that line is beta. And now the next step is, well, I want to look for a region where this is happening. So in the next plot, in, in plot B, I'm showing the beta, the beta that was estimated from here across the genome, right? So this is a slope plotted against genome. And this point comes from this picture. But then there's 20 other pictures like it for every one of these 20 points. OK, so now I have what appears to be a region where the slope is changing for a group of them. Now I'm going to ask, is that statistically significant, is the next question. So how do I do that, right? So, so we learned about multiple testing, and, and, and we learned about statistical inference. But how do I do statistical inference for a region? How do I do statistical inference for a region that I've scanned through to find? That, so that is, that is a, I view that as an open area of research. I'm going to tell you one approach. but. Statisticians are working on, on problems like this today. It's not, a, it's, it's not a, a, a problem that has a standard solution. So here's one solution. You take the area under the curve as a summary statistic of the region. So, that's, so now we're going to get one number, whatever area that is. And we keep that area to, to describe this region. And now we're going to ask if that is statistically significant. So we need to know the null distribution for that area. That is, sounds difficult. It's because it is. Right? There's, what is a t-test version of that? So there is no standard recipe for that. So one, one thing you can do, and this is what was done in this particular example, is that you uh, permute the samples. So you take the ages and you permute them randomly so that the, so you force the null hypothesis to be true. This is the permutation test we've talked about earlier. And you run the whole thing again. You get slopes, you, you smooth them, you get their area. You re run the whole thing again, you get areas at the end. And you do it over and over and over again. You permute, 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 permute. Every time you will get areas. Those are the areas you get are the, are the areas you get under the null hypothesis therefore defining the null distribution of uh, areas. And that's what this figure is showing. So you can see, this is, this is what the areas you get under the null model. And look at where this guy is. 
So would you say that's significant? No, no not even close. So it does. It, it originally, I, I think some of you might have been thinking this is a interesting region, but it turns out this can happen by chance. So it, it's it's a little counterintuitive. It seems so nice, you know. It's nice and you know, it's a whole region of them, and there's a smooth pattern. This data is this kind of data, and it's also true for Chipsic, is very difficult to deal with in, the, in terms of inference because it's correlated across the genome. So if you make one quote unquote mistake of going up, then a whole series of them can follow that can follow that because they're correlated, and you get a whole region that is not that is that looks like a real difference when it's not. All right, so uh, this is. This should, I should have put this earlier. This is now showing you how I, we actually get rid of some of the batch effect by fitting SVA. This is the figure I showed you, and this is after SVA. Okay, so that's that's the general one general approach to detecting differences in methylation data, and I think it applies to other approaches where you're searching for regions that are behaving differently in two conditions. So. This, you, might, you might try this approach in ChIP-seq, although in ChIP-seq we know that we're looking for a very specific kind of shape, like a triangle shape. In the case of methylation, we don't know what we're looking for. It could be a long stretch, it could be a short one, it could be a bump that is tall, one that's not that tall. All right, so now getting back to the, to the idea I, I mentioned earlier, that by just being the first to look, to be able to see this, we can make discoveries. So I'm going to show you some pictures where we applied similar, a similar method to find differences between tissues. So this was the first data set, as far as I know, that was looking at the entire genome, not the entire genome, but parts of the genome other than islands. So at the moment, this is in 2006 or so, in that time, most of the commercial products were looking for differences at islands. So you, you had an array that, rep that had the different islands represented. We had an array that went beyond that. It looked in islands and elsewhere. So now we have data from different tissues. You can see different colors in this plot. There's three tissues, liver, spleen, and brain. And there's five replicates for each one. These are, these are from primary tissues, not cell lines. So this is, must be from dead people. Um, because otherwise you can't get liver, brain, and spleen. Well, especially brain. <laughs> well, there are ways to get it, right? You could drill a hole and take a little piece. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. there's these are cadavers. Okay, so yeah, we didn't we didn't um, drill holes in people's heads. So there's five there's five separate individuals. This is very actually quite nice data. It's not very common to get data like this. We have primary tissues. Uh, and replicates with biological replicates. So, what what we did, what I did here is I that method I just showed you. I apply and I look for regions that have big differences and the area is big, right? So you can see a difference here. So this is now we get we have this massive data set with many locations in the genome. Using the approach I just described, we can rank regions that we find. That's already a big step. That's another difference between the microscope. The microscope, you're kind of looking and you see what you see. Here, we could look at 10,000 different things. So part of what, what us as data analysts, we do is we, we can rank things to look at first. So instead of just looking at 10,000 things, you say, let's look at these 10 first. And so this, this, this screening idea of you, you pick things that, are, that appear to be interesting as opposed to just looking at the whole thing. So that is, that's a important step which I think is underestimated especially by statisticians that, that they don't appreciate how important that step is of just being able to take all this data and rank locations to look at first and supposed to again as opposed to looking at everything so here's the first um, region now down in, in this pane here I have CPGs that's what the ticks are densities of those CPGs so this is a dense area and in orange, I have the islands that are defined in, in the databases. So an island array would be measuring DNA methylation here and not where, nowhere else. 
And where's the difference between ki kidney, liver, and spleen? It's right outside of that. So this is, the f this is the first region ranked by this algorithm, the biggest area. Here's the second one. Here's the difference. Here's the island. So if you were measuring islands, you would be seeing this. Here's the third biggest. There's the difference here. There's the island there. The fourth biggest. Island, and there's the difference. So and I'm just showing you three. Uh, four I showed you. Uh, there's many more, and it was quite consistent that the biggest differences between tissues were not in the islands. So those that were measuring islands, we're not going to see this. And that was that. This that was a discovery, and uh, that was published in Nature Genetics. And the, the, we gave it a name. We call them the CPG sh Island Shores, which is now caught on, and you're going to see some of the new products have that name in them. This, the shores and the new new arrays now are looking elsewhere because they saw this discovery and they say we also want to measure that. So the new products do include shores and 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 other things. Okay. So this this figure is just showing where the re, where the differences were occurring. Uh, here's it's a, it's a statistical plot as I'm going to explain in a second. I'm dividing each of the regions the, D, the D, DMRs that were found between tissues into those that were in islands, those that o, that overlap with islands, those were outside of the islands, and this is I define this as a shore, 2,000 base pairs from the island, and elsewhere. Now, what is this? This is what you expect to see if these DMRs were random, were randomly picked for the array, because the array is biased towards, to, in the, towards islands and things with high CPG density. So you expect to see more things in the, in, around the islands. So what you see in this picture is that the shores are overrepresented. There's, you see more than you expect by chance. And, and for islands, you actually see less than you expect by chance. So the islands seem to be not changing across tissues. Now we also looked at cancer. We also look at um, cancer and we looked at hypermethylation and, and hypomethylation. So hypermethylation was enriched in, uh, well, somewhat enriched in islands, which is what the conventional wisdom said. And hypomethylation was enriched no, not in islands, not in shores, but far away. Actually, they're somewhat, no, they're somewhat enriched in, in shores, but mostly in this stuff. So, now this, the array, something I didn't mention is the, you cannot make it an array that assays all the CPGs. There's too many of them. That's one of the reasons why they made island arrays, because they can fit them in an array. The array that was used here was... Uh, was maximizing the number of CPGs that we can measure without, without taking into account islands. But if you do that, if you, if you maximize the number of CPGs you can fit into an array, of course you're going to put more, you're going to overrepresent islands because the density of CPGs is high, thus you measure more. But it was still done without taking into account islands, so you, we also had other regions like the shores and a little bit of outside the, sh the, the, the regions near the shore. So now, the array was very, was lacking in measuring CPGs that were far away from islands, which is what has appeared to be most interesting when we looked at hypomethylation in cancer. So that is, the most interesting part in hypomethylated cancer was not being measured by this array. So then what? Well, how do we, now we want to measure that. The array can't measure that, so what can we do to measure that? What do you think came next? Sequencing. Sequencing. Okay, so now I'm going to take a little break, very quick uh, three-minute break, and then we are going to talk about how we can use sequencing to measure DNA methylation. You have to have more than two cells. Okay, so... so you have so how do we use sequencing to measure methylation? Methylated here. Oh, all right. So there's a very there's a trick, there's a chemical trick, that um, if you have DNA, uh, that's what's over here on the right. 
It's called bisulfite treat treatment. If you treat this DNA with bisulfite, it'll it'll change all the C's to T's. See how the C's are turned into T's, except when they're methylated. So if I if if this is my genome, I treat it with bisulfite, and I sequence this. If I if I'm able to map this genome to this region, I will know that this is a methylated C because it's stayed C. And I will know that this is an unmethylated C because it mutated. Very neat trick. Okay, so we're gonna that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the genome and we are going to treat it with bisulfite. Then knowing that most of the T's or most of the C's turn to T's, we're gonna align it to the genome. I'm going to get something like this. All right, so there, those are all my reads. And I'm interested in, in knowing what happened at this particular CG. So I look here. I look a little closer. Even closer, that's all that matters. All the other stuff I don't really care about. And I get to the conclusion that what is my estimate of methylation there? So there's a hint up at the title of the talk. 80% is methylated. 80% of the C's, stayed C's, and two changed. So this is this is the this is the estimate of the proportion of CPGs that are methylated at that site. Now there's some there is this has error in it, right? Because we could we're sampling from a population that has we, we don't know what it is, we're trying to estimate it. And we only got to see ten pieces. So there is some variability associated with this. It's 80% plus or minus something like 10 or 20%. So that, that's the general trick. Now, if we want to get a precise estimate of this, we need to, uh, I mean, pe some people are saying 30x, 30x coverage to get a, a precise estimate of that CPG. So that, what does that mean? That, we, that means we need 30x for each sample. We want to add replicates to that, biological replicates. We're talking a lot of money uh, and it's it's only the big big projects that can do something like this but now in the microarray work we were smoothing to, to find things so if you're smoothing you are as we learned in, in, in the previous lecture when you smooth you remove some of the variability you gain some precision which means we might be able to get away with less uh, coverage Okay, so that's what this data is here. Is this is data from an experiment we ran that had coverage of 4x roughly. So you can see there's a lot of variability in the data. So each one of these dots is a, is a CPG and it's the estimate. So you know this one is this one here is 0.6. This one here is 0.75. The size of the circle has to do with how much coverage that particular CPG had. You see, we have all this noise associated with, with, with the experiment, but we, we can smooth and get better uh, results. So, so we're going to smooth, we're going we're gonna to use something called something like low S. So the first step is to convert the data into, into a scale that's in the continuum, minus 10, 10, instead of between 0 and 1. And then for each location, for example, this location, the estimate we're going to provide for methylation status is not going to be the observed little ball. Instead, we're going to smooth that region. We're going to smooth the, a group of CPGs around it, assuming that C, the CPG methylation is a smooth function of the genome. And in this case, we're going to fit a parabola. There's a parabola. And keep this estimate. If we do that for the entire uh, genome, uh, we get this this result. So this black line is the estimate of methylation based on 4x coverage. So I, I think that's pretty good and we saved our collaborators something like two million dollars for the particular experiment we did. Yeah, question? So for non-CPG like CA methylation, yeah. can we do this method too? Or is it you can do that too. Uh, yeah. Yes. I mean, the, the problem is, I think most. I, I expect that most data is going to just be zero. Yeah, you will have 
push this. So I would have to see it first, but it could that could just look like zero zero zero, and then every if if it's true that there is methylation outside of CPGs, you're thinking in the brain or something. In I mean stem cells. In stem cells, yeah. yes, you could look at it, but again, it's going to be. Yeah, we have to look. I can't. I don't want to say you can just do it, but I think so. Okay. So now, the, the, another point I want to make is that you you can get almost the same results you get when you do 4x than when you do 30x. So the data I'm showing here is from a experiment that actually did 30x. They only did one sample, so they could afford it, and they uh, they give you the uh, pink is their estimate based on 30x. The black is what we get when we subsample from theirs to get it to 40x and, and you almost get the same result. So just for a fifth of the price you get the same result. Okay so just some of the biology that, were, that was found. Again this is an experiment where we're the first ones to look at it. In this case it was another statistician, Casper Hansen, who, who gave the RNA-seq lecture who was looking through and he made some discoveries. One of them I'm going to show you in a bit. Uh, but the first thing I want to show you is the, the, uh, uh, a picture of the types of smooth we find, say, on an island. So now it's, it's pretty clear. You can see the, the, uh, it's, this data is much cleaner than the microarray data. You can see the island is unmethylated. And in cancer, it does look like this particular island is somewhat methylated. So you see hypermethylation of islands. But the other thing we see is that as you continue out, the, what, what, it doesn't look like it's just that the island is getting hypermethylated. It just seems like the, the structure of the methylation pattern has been lost, and now it's just like this flat thing. So one of the reasons why I mean, there are some people reporting that the, the relationship between cancer methylation and island methylation and gene expression is not what they expected is really not that strong and it could be because this might make the gene silence but this would make it would have the opposite effect right? so which of the two will, will have a bigger effect right? so here this is here there's higher methylation here there's lower methylation so if the genes here which which of these two is going to is going to make it go up or down the rule of thumb uh, it still has to be accepted by everyone, but is that if you have more than 6 to 7 percent methylation within a length before or after the, the promoter? PSS, the PSF, the procedure starts at the, in the in, in an island, the promoter, then it's going to be silenced. But you know, th that length can be between 1,000 base pairs upstream and oh, yeah. to 1,000 downstream for the prosecution start site. But that's really a rule of thumb. Like, nobody's done a systematic yeah, right. evaluation. I, mm -hmm. And uh, it might be the case that in this figure, that will not happen. Yeah. In other, in other yeah. figures. Well, let me. Here, here's a, a shore. This is the island. And this is a case where there is a big difference at the shore. And what it looks like is happening is I, I, when I look at this, I, it, it seems to me like this is on its way to becoming this. Right? It's like it's stretching, it's starting to stretch, and if you keep stretching it off, it's eventually just going to get flat. And then, but th then, now getting back to what's this, right? So th th those are all islands and shores, so what about this stuff that's far away? So this is the discovery that was made here, is that when you look at a big picture, this is no longer a small little section, this is 100 kilobases, so this is a couple of megabytes worth of data. We see the normals are blue, the cancers are red, we see long stretches. Long stretches of, of, uh, of parts of the genome that are hypomethylated. So we have things happening differently at the islands and shores than is happening in, in the rest of the genome. And this, is the, that, this was, the, I think, the main discovery that was made with this data, with this new data looking at the whole genome methylation. So, um, the, the, these are plots sort of giving summary statistics of, of the genome. The, the blue lines are the normals. So this is the distribution of methylation across the whole genome for normals. You can see that it's about 70% is, is hype, it's methylated at the 80% level. And then there's some, some, some of the, well, 
some regions have zero methylation, those are probably the islands, and kind of nothing in between. Right, that's the blue. But look at the cancers. It looks like this region is now shifting down. And, and that's what, it, you know, these must be those blocks that we just saw, those long hypomethylated blocks. Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop.